Welcome to the session, Data Science on Databricks. In this session, we will model a data scientist's work at a fictional health tracking company called Movio. Movio sells a wearable health tracker device that collects data for its users to monitor their physical activity. We will create and explore an aggregate sample created from user event data. We will design an MLflow experiment to estimate the bias and variance of several models. And we'll use EDA and estimated model bias and variance to select a family of models for further model development. We have access to daily user health event data, including body mass index, maximum VO2, active heart rate, resting heart rate, and user provided labels of their lifestyles. Let's get started. I'm going to be working through this course using Databricks Community Edition. You are encouraged to do the same while watching the webinar. To get started, the first thing you should do is create a new cluster. Here I am at the Databricks home. I'm going to click the Clusters tab and create a cluster. I'm going to give it a name based on today's topic and select the latest machine learning runtime version. Here we can see the cluster coming online. To follow along, you will need to make sure that you have downloaded the DBC containing the course materials. I have downloaded these materials to my desktop. I'm going to navigate to my home directory Click the drop down and select import. I'm going to import from a file. I'm going to go back to my desktop, and drag the file to the upload area. When it's ready, I'm going to click import. And that should import the notebooks we'll need into my workspace. In the next notebook, we will run a few utility functions so that the data we will be working with is available to us in our workspace. In a typical workflow, data will have been made available to you, the data scientist, as tables that can be queried using SQL or PySpark. This notebook mirrors a typical workflow where the data has been made available to you by a data engineer. OK, I'm going to get started with the 00 Getting Started Notebook. I'm here at the home page of my Databricks workspace. I'm going to navigate to the home directory where I've uploaded the DVC. Uh, from there, I'm going to go into the Python directory. And here are all of the notebooks that we are going to be working from in this part of the webinar series. I'm going to start with 00 Getting Started. Uh, make sure that it's attached to uh, the cluster I'm working from. Mine is already attached. Let me go ahead and detach that and show you one more time so that you can see what it would look like if it was not attached. So if it was not attached, it would look like this. And I would just click on the drop down and then select the cluster that I've chosen for this course. So as I note here, it says before getting started, make sure that you update the notebook include slash configuration with your preferred username. So I'm actually going to jump over there real quick. Let me go back to uh, Workspace and select Includes. There it is, Includes slash Configuration. I'm going to open up that notebook. And in fact, look at that. We have our first to do. So it says to do username equals fill this in. So if I had run this, we would have had a problem because fill this in is not defined in this workspace. I'm going to need to put a string here with my preferred username. I'm going to use the username that I use uh, in most places, which is just my name, first and last, Joshua Cook. And that's going to be just fine. I actually don't need to execute this notebook. I just need to update it. Uh, and then it will be called when we run the other notebook. So I'm going to go back there, back to the workspace, choose 00, zero getting started again. And now it says before getting started, yep. I've done that already. I'm ready to go. So I'm going to kick this off. I'm going to source the include slash utilities notebook. It says include configuration notebook, which we just updated. 
uh, define uh, data paths and configure the database. So the next thing that I'm going to do is make the notebook identitate. Uh, so that's, that's what this step is going to, going to do. Uh, what this means is that if I run the notebook more than once, uh, it is going to not cause any issues. And basically, you could think of this as a way to, to reset everything if we wanted to run this again. So I'm going to uh, run that function right there. Uh, it says false. That's because I haven't run this before. If I had run it before and there were some files there, it would say true. So the first thing we're going to do here is retrieve and load the data that we're going to, going to be working with. Uh, these are two files, one called health profile data and another called user profile data. These are being made available to us as parquet files. So I'm going to use a function called process file that's going to retrieve those functions and load them into our workspace. Uh, this function takes three arguments, file name, path, and table name. This function is going to do three things. First, it's going to retrieve a file and load it into our Databricks workspace. Then it's going to create a Delta table using that file. Then it's going to register the table in the Metastore so that it can be referenced using SQL or a PySpark table reference. And this brings us to our first exercise. We need to retrieve and load the data. So we're going to retrieve the data using the following arguments. So the file, we have a file name here, uh, a path where we're going to be loading the data, and uh, then a table name that we're going to use for the, ta the, the table. So uh, this may be a bit confusing. Um, it might help if I let you know that these paths have actually been defined for us in the configuration file. So we can see that silver daily path is already defined for us. Uh, as is dim user path. You can see both of those paths already exist. So what we're going to do is take this function process file that takes three arguments, and we're going to call it right here in this, uh, in this cell. So it's going to take three arguments. Uh, these are the arguments right here. I'm going to be lazy and just copy paste. Uh, these are, this one here is a string, so it's going to need to be a string. The path, as we noted, is already defined, so uh, it's not a string. And then the table name is, in fact, a string. So what, this is going to be uh, how we're going to process uh, the first file. Now we have to do this for both files. So let's go ahead and get the other arguments here. Same thing. This should be a string. This is a variable. And this is a string. I'm going to run that function. And here it's going. So as I noted previously, this, is, this, this process here is uh, something that you probably wouldn't be doing as a data scientist. This would have been done for you uh, by the data engineer. So I wouldn't worry too much about exactly what's happening here. Uh, if you are interested in reading about it, you can, of course, check check out the uh, include slash utilities notebook where the code that is uh, defining this function is written. Uh, but you know, for most data scientists, the data is going to be available to you. You might have to create aggregates or different, different other kinds of tables. Uh, but getting the data to you from an external source is usually handled. Looks like this is uh, wrapping up here. So it's retrieved the, uh, the file. It's loaded it into a location. So it loaded it into this location as a, as a Delta table. Uh, and then it registered that table in the, the Metastore. Same thing for the user profile data. So this brings us to the end of the getting started notebook. In this notebook, we will sample 3% of our user health tracker event data. We will then use this sample to create aggregates for each user over the sample set of users. This aggregate will be the basis of all of the work we will be doing in the first part of the webinar series. Because the data has been made available to us as Delta tables, this notebook will use Apache Spark to read and write the data. At the end of this notebook, we will write the sample aggregate to a Delta table. Using Delta tables is a Databricks best practice for persisting and sharing data. Okay, here I am back at the home. I'm going to navigate into the project once more, clicking the home button. Here's that DBC I loaded, going into Python. 
here's all the notebooks that we're working from. We've already done zero, zero, getting started. Just a reminder, if you haven't done it already, first, it's critical that you set up your configuration file, add your username there. Second, it's critical that you run that getting started notebook because it's gonna bring in the data. Okay, I'm gonna jump in to create aggregate sample. Here we are. I am going to attach to my cluster. Let's go ahead and run that configuration file. Defines the data paths, configures the database. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna that we're going to do is create Spark references to the data that we're working with. We have these two files that we've got in these two Parquet files that we've got in. Uh, and now they're registered in our system or they're loaded into our system as delta tables. Uh, one of those ta uh, tables is user profile data and the other is health profile data. And there's a correspondence between the two. So the health profile data is data corresponding to the users in the user profile data. Uh, so what we're going to do here is actually uh, create Spark references to that data using the uh, names that we used uh, when we defined the table. So here I am, I'm gonna go spark.read.table. And this is the table name right here. So my user profile DF is going to reference that table. And then the health profile DF is going to reference this uh, this data here, health profile data. Okay, so uh, this is, um, if you're new to Spark, this is something that might be a little bit tricky. Spark data frames are a little bit different from Pandas data frames. Uh, Pandas data frames actually loads the data into memory and a Pandas data frame exists in memory. A Spark data frame is more a reference to where the data is on disk so that you can retrieve the data when you need it. It's part of this whole uh, lazy loading thing that Spark does. We're not gonna go too far into it. Uh, we're just going to be defining these references here. Now, another thing that to note is that because we're working in Databricks, we already have a Spark reference defined. Uh, when I'm working locally, when I'm using a different tool, I always have to define my own Spark reference. Uh, when I'm using Databricks, I don't need to do that. It's just available to us when we start up the notebook. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do here is display the schema of the data that we're going to be working with. So uh, let's print the, uh, the schema here. And luckily, data frame, the data frame uh, class, the Spark data frame class is a really handy uh, method we can use to do this called print schema. So I'm going to do that uh, here and I'm going to print uh, both of those uh, schemas. And there they are. So it looks like uh, our user profile data uh, has some uh, attributes associated with each user, uh, and a unique ID, first name, last name, the, the lifestyle they've identified. Remember that we have three of those here, uh, whether or not they are a woman, uh, country, and their, their occupation. And then the health profile data is actually event data associated with each user. So that ID is going to reference a user in our user uh, table. We're going to have the date associated with them. And then uh, several attributes recorded on that date uh, for each of those users. So uh, that's the schema of the data that we're going to be working with. So let's jump on. Let's get a, a count of the users that we have. And it looks like we have 3,000 users in that user profile data. All right, so just to get a sense of uh, what we're working with here, uh, let's get uh, the minimum and maximum dates for, the, uh, for all the data in the health profile data. Uh, I'm going to use the minimum and maximum PySpark SQL functions, and I'm going to get the minimum of the date column and maximum of the date column. Uh, so if you're wondering why I used DTE instead of uh, DATE, it's because uh, DATE is a reserved word in Spark SQL and didn't want to have any collisions, so I'm just using DTE for date. So it looks like here's the minimum and the maximum. So uh, appears we have an entire year of data. We're going from uh, January 1st, 2019 to 
uh, January to December 31st, 2019. All right, so if you recall earlier, there are three lifestyles associated with our users. Uh, and uh, let's just have a look at those. So I am selecting the lifestyle column from the uh, user uh, data and I'm using the distinct operator on that to see the distinct values of lifestyle. So that's running and it looks like we do in fact have three. We have the sedentary lifestyle, the weight trainer and the cardio trainer lifestyles. All right, now this is going to be the, the critical piece uh, of this webinar. Uh, we are not going to be working on all of the data. We're going to be working on a sample of the data, uh, just trying to get a sense of what the data is. So it doesn't make sense to do our exploration on all of the data. Of course, we're going to want to use all of the data eventually. But for uh, this component, we're just going to sample it and look at a smaller sample uh, just to get a sense of what we're looking at. So I'm actually taking, I'm using the, the sample method from the data frame uh, class. And I'm going to be sampling 3% of the data. And just to get, uh, I'm going to then group it by life, group that sample by lifestyle and get counts to see how many people from each lifestyle uh, we're talking about. So it looks like I have uh, 25 people who identify themselves as sedentary, 35 who identify as weight trainers, and 29 who identify as cardio trainers. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do is join the two data sets that I have together. Uh, now, we also have an assertion statement here when we're done. Uh, because we have a year of data for each user, we would expect that the uh, sample uh, full health profile would have 365 times as much data as the user profile. This is because for each user, there should be 365 rows in that health profile sample. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that join. So uh, the two data frames that we're looking at, I'm going to just scroll back up and grab those names. Uh, so we have this one and this one. I'm going to copy those, come back here. Okay, so we're going to do a join. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to start with, uh, actually we don't, we want the sample, don't we? We want the user profile sample. We're going to join the user profile sample to the entire uh, health profile data. So the health profile data is daily data for every single one of our users. We're going to join just the sample to that uh, data frame uh, in order to get the daily data for our sample. Uh, and I'm going to, so I'm going to join the, the user profile sample to the full health, health profile data. And I'm going to use the column uh, ID to do that. And here we go. And it looks like everything went well. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with this assertion, uh, the way that it works is if that had been false, uh, it would have actually raised an assertion error. So let's have a look at this health profile sample that we generated. Uh, this is uh, this is the data frame, the sample data frame that we that we just generated, and you can see that we've got uh, different users here. Uh, so so far we've got Sharon Salinas, Caitlin James, Benjamin Molina, William Coleman. So there's there's a lot of different uh, users in here, uh, different lifestyles. Uh, we have gender, we have uh, country, their occupation. And then these are recorded here for each uh, for each date. And then it has their, uh, their resting heart rate uh, for that day, their active heart rate for that day, uh, BMI, VO2 max, how many minutes uh, they worked out on that day. Uh, so this is the data that we're going to be looking at. Uh, but really what, what we're after here is um, a profile of user, right? We want to be able to take uh, all of this daily event data that we're taking in and use that to create a profile of user that we could then use to classify a, a user. So, uh, you know, the, the premise here is let's say if we knew the, uh, the average BMI of a user, the average active heart rate, the average resting heart rate, 
the average VO2 max, if we, if we knew those values for one of our users, we could predict what lifestyle that they, they would have and therefore, you know, recommend different kinds of, of workouts. Hey, you know, if you have a sedentary lifestyle, maybe try out this uh, beginner level workout, you know, just to get a good workout habit going. Uh, or, you know, maybe if they're a cardio trainer, hey, did, you know, you should try doing, you know, this, these, uh, these sprints next week. You know, the idea being that if we can take this aggregate data uh, to identify, to create a profile of users, we can use that to uh, actually drive their engagement with the product. Okay, so let's go ahead and build these profiles. We're going to do that by uh, performing aggregations over the, uh, the sample table that we've created. So uh, these are the aggregations that we're going to perform. So we're going to do a, a mean of these four features, and we're going to rename those uh, features when we do that to, uh, to, to have these names. So let's go ahead and get started. And I am going to be super lazy and do this. And I'm going to show you a fancy feature that is available in the Databricks workspace, which is the ability to use multi cursors. So you can see that I'm selecting right there. I'm holding down command and I'm going to select uh, each of the places that I want to do this. And now I'm just going to. Um, type on each line at the same time, which is pretty fancy. So I'm turning each of those into a string, uh, string, and then close the parentheses. So that's, I'm creating a mean on each of those, uh, alias as these names. Oops, let's do this. Boop, boop, there we go. And I'm going to put a comma after each one of those. And let's go ahead and run that. And we can click on this little drop down here to have a look at uh, the schema of the data, the data frame we've just created. Um, I probably did that. If you're not used to the multi cursor thing, I probably did that a lot faster than some of you. Uh, might be typing at home. So let's just hang out here for just a moment. Um, so this is actually going to be critical because we are uh, going to be testing that schema in just a moment. So we're, we're going to need to make sure that we have the correct schema, including the column rename. So you are going to need to run these, these aliases on each of the columns to rename them uh, using these names. Uh, so you know, I'm going to go ahead while we're, we're I'm going to still give you a minute to, to be typing that in. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, have a look at this data we've just created here. Uh, so I inserted a cell underneath. Uh, this is not going to be required. This is just a thing I'm doing real quick. Let's collapse that. Uh, so let's go ahead and have a look at this data we just created. So I'm just running, I'm using the built-in display function as available as part of Databricks uh, to display the data. And you can see here's uh, all this data that we've created. So I have, I've only included these four numerical features. I do have the lifestyle associated with each uh, person. And then I don't actually have uh, the, the anything beyond just the ID any longer. I've discarded everything but the ID. Uh, so this is this aggregate data. This is the data we're going to be using throughout this uh, this webinar. So this is super critical that we get this right. Okay, and because it's so important to get it right, I am actually going to uh, run this uh, test on the schema of the data frame that we just created. So I'm asserting that this data frame that we just created has this has this schema right here. Let's run that, and uh, it passed. Uh, again, if it had failed, it would raise an error. If it just goes and doesn't do anything, that means that the assertion passed. All right, now the last step that we're going to do is to persist this data so that it's going to be available 
in other notebooks as we're working through this webinar. And the, the way I'm going to do that is by writing the data to a delta table. So I'm going to do take that data frame and I'm going to use the, the uh, write uh, and use the format delta uh, with mode overwrite. And I, the only thing I need to do here is tell it where. Uh, so I'm going to do a dot save and give it this name right here. And this is where we're going to save that data. So if you're wondering where that gold path comes from, that comes from the configuration file that we've been that we set up at the beginning uh, of the of the webinar. So while that's running, we can go ahead and just pop that in here if you want to have a look at it. Uh, it's just a string, uh, and it defines a reference to a location in uh, DBFS, the Databricks file system. So that is writing right now, and you can see that's where the data was saved. Uh, if you really want to uh, do even do something fancier, we can even have a look at it. We can do display. Uh, dbutils.fs for file system.ls for list. So I'm going to do a list on the file system and I'm going to list everything at the gold path uh, and in this location. So this should list all of those files there. And so these are the files that I have written. This is uh, this is the delta table. So I'm not going to go too far into delta tables, but basically it means that we've written to this location using uh, Parquet, uh, and we have a delta log. Uh, this is a best practice uh, for persisting data beyond a specific notebook. In this notebook, we will do exploratory data analysis on the aggregate sample. This EDA will be done primarily through SciPy-based visualization tools available as part of the Databricks machine learning runtime. To use these SciPy-based tools, we will need to convert from a Spark data frame to a Pandas data frame. Luckily, there is a method to Pandas that does just this. OK, so we're just trucking along here. I am going to go back to the workspace. You know, just a little uh, note here. I am, I generally, when I'm working in a project, I try not to click home. If I click home, I'm going to go back to the my home. But workspace is going to take me right back to where I've been working. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a few extra clicks. But I am lazy, so I don't like to make those extra clicks. So I'm going to open up the Explore Aggregate Data Notebook here. Again, I am going to attach to the cluster where I have been working. Run that configuration. Uh, again, if you haven't done that yet, you're not going to be able to work through this. Uh, but I doubt that you would have made it this far without having run, uh, updated the configuration file. But uh, just FYI. All right. so. Uh, we, in the last notebook, we wrote this uh, sample aggregate data that we created. We wrote it to uh, a delta table, and now we're going to actually load it back into this notebook. So uh, to do that, we have to do two things. So one, we have to use spark.read to read that delta table, and the other is we're going to use the two pandas uh, method to convert that uh, Spark data frame as a pandas data frame. Uh, I notice I say the word load here because remember, a Spark data frame is a reference to the data, but a pandas data frame is actually uh, data in memory. Um, so let's see, let's do dot load and provide it with the uh, this, this uh, location right here. You know, while, while we're doing that, you know, it's it's worth thinking about uh, when we would want to uh, use Spark and when we would want to use Pandas. Um, Pandas is perfectly fine to use on this small sample, this 3% this sample of the data uh, that we're working with. We would probably not want to use Pandas on all of the data. Pandas is uh, going to be single node data work. Whereas Spark is designed for distributed processing, Spark can handle all the data. Uh, and if it was going too slow, we can just add more uh, machines to our cluster to speed up the process. 
So, uh, you know, this is part part of that's not to say that pandas isn't useful. Pandas is very useful. It's just uh, it's it's going to be appropriate for smaller data, which is one of the reasons why we're working uh, on a sample. Uh, so let's go ahead and load that uh, data frame in. So it's loading in right now. OK, we have that loaded. Uh, next, we're going to load the different SciPy libraries that we're going to be using. So, uh, you know, these are the, the classics, the classic SciPy libraries that no doubt you are all familiar with. Uh, Matplotlib, NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn, all the good stuff. Uh, you may not be as familiar with Seaborn, but uh, hopefully you will get, a, get an appreciation from it for it from this notebook, because we're going to use Seaborn a little bit here. Uh, OK, first thing. Let's have a look at the unique lifestyles. So uh, those are actually going to be available uh, as the lifestyle column uh, in the pandas data frame. And one thing I also want to point out here, when we did this with Spark, we used the uh, distinct operator. With pandas, we're going to use the unique operator. So uh, it does the same thing, just a slight difference there, uh, which is worth pointing out. There are the, uh, the three lifestyles that we're going to be working with. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is actually split uh, the, the data we're working with into uh, features and target. So the features are going to be all of the numerical um, feature or numerical columns in the data frame. And target is uh, going to be this, this column lifestyle. So you know if I was to do something like, uh, this, put this data frame here, this pandas data frame here, and type D types, that actually is going to give us uh, the columns in the data frame with the types associated with each column. And so when I go here, uh, uh, health tracker sample aggregate uh, pandas data frame, select D types and exclude the objects. So it's going to select all of the columns, uh, excluding those that have type objects. So this is going to give me just the numerical uh, columns, and that'll be my features. And then the target is going to be uh, another data frame uh, that's just the lifestyle column. And uh, I'm going to make a copy of that for uh, pandas specific reasons that I'm not going to go into right now. Uh, OK, so here we are. Uh, if we're going to use, we're going to generate our first uh, visualization to do EDA on the features. Uh, so we want to use Seaborn to display a pair plot of our features. So this is actually uh, pretty pretty simple, uh, actually very simple, which is one of the reasons why I like Seaborn. Uh, and I told, remember I told you that I think if you weren't familiar with it, that you're going to like it. Well, this is why. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward command, and and the the plot that it's going to generate for us. Uh, is is a pretty nice plot, so it's it's great to have this available uh, behind such a simple uh, API, which is the advantage of working with Seaborn. Uh, so the uh, the diagonal here is actually a distribution plot of each of the features. And we're going to look at those in more detail uh, using uh, actual distribution plots in just a moment. Uh, but this gives us a sense of you know just how the features are distributed against each other. So. I mean, this this is really clear right here, right? We can see that there is a very strong linear relationship between mean resting heart rate and uh, mean VO2 max. Uh, we can, you know, we we can see that. And obviously, uh, everything above the diagonal is a mirror of everything below the diagonal. So we really only need to look at uh, one one set of data. Uh, this looks like it also has, but you know, mean active heart rate and mean resting heart rate also has uh, a linear relationship. I should probably point out that there is a negative linear relationship between mean VO2 max and mean resting heart rate. So a high VO2 max would correspond to a low resting heart rate, which would make sense. You know, uh, VO2 refers to uh, how much oxygen you have available to you while you're exercising. And if you have a, a lot of oxygen available to, your, to you while you're exercising, you're probably someone who has a low resting heart rate. So those, uh, those it makes sense that they have a negative linear, rela uh, linear relationship. Uh, and then a positive linear relationship between uh, active heart rate and resting heart rate, that, is, that also makes sense. 
Uh, BMI is a little bit all over the place. So that's that's something that uh, could pre present uh, a challenge to us. So if we look at BMI versus each of the other three features, uh, yeah, it's it's all over the place. You know, maybe uh, if you look at this uh, distributed by um, lifestyle, maybe we get some more insight there. But just looking at it at this level, uh, BMI it could be a tricky feature. Uh, okay, so uh, next we're going to use Seaborn again uh, to display a distribution plot for each feature. So I've written a little bit of boilerplate uh, code for you here because this one is going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, there's not much to do here. You just need to use uh, dist plot in order to uh, get that distribution plot here. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. So these are, I said we were going to look at the distributions in more detail, where here we are, we're using the Seaborn dist plot uh, API to generate these, distri these distribution plots. Uh, pretty, no like, especially mean BMI is very normal. Uh, active heart rate, pretty normal. We got a little bump, little bump there. Uh, resting heart rate, some interesting behavior here. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, this is this is good to look at. But what I'm really interested in is I want to look at these distribution plots, but uh, disaggregated by the, the different lifestyles that we're looking at. So let's go ahead and run the uh, the same code here. Uh, but now I want to look at it uh, against each lifestyle. So uh, we're going to use matplotlib to generate a series of subplots. We want four of them. And then we're going to actually enumerate over each of the features. Uh, so this is essentially uh, enumerate as a Python function that is going to give us each of the features one at a time in a for loop uh, and also give us an index associated with each one of those. And we're actually going to use that index to uh, tell uh, matplotlib uh, which uh, subplot we want each feature to go on. So uh, Axe is going to be references to each of our subplots. And then uh, we are going to, you know, so the first, first one goes in the first subplot, second on the second, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then we're going to iterate over each of the lifestyles. If you recall earlier, we actually uh, defined this list, lifestyles, to be uh, the unique lifestyles, the three lifestyles, weight trainer, cardio trainer, and sedentary. So we're going to iterate over each of those lifestyles. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that uh, the target uh, data frame and this lifestyle column there. You know what? Let me be consistent and use uh, only this. You know, if you may know pandas has two different ways to reference data. We're going to use be consistent. Use the same one. So we're going to look at that target lifestyle column, and where that target lifestyle column is equal to the current value of lifestyle as we're going through the loop. I want the features associated with that uh, with that person, right? So this is going to give us a subset uh, of the data for each iteration through the loop. So it'll give us just the weightlifters, uh, just the cardio trainers, just the sedentary. And then we're going to use Seaborn again. We're going to generate a distribution plot, uh, which is dist plot is the keyword there. Uh, we're going to generate a distribution plot um, where we look at the subset, but just the feature we're interested in, put it on the uh, the subplot where we want it to go, and then label it with that word lifestyle. All right, let's go ahead and run that. And here we go. This is what I'm looking for. This is really helping me out because now I can tell that uh, we do actually have uh, significant differences between each of the three lifestyles against each of these features. And, you know, so, I mean, look at this, like resting heart rate um, is significantly, not only is it significantly higher for those who have a sedentary lifestyle, there's also a much wider range of resting heart rates uh, for, for those with sedentary lifestyle. Uh, the cardio trainers have uh, a market a market difference between them. I mean, if you think about it, even if, if we took off sedentary here and just compared weight trainers to cardio trainers, the cardio trainers would have a significantly lower uh, resting heart rate. And 
a significantly higher VO2 max. So that's actually going to help us if we're if we're able to look at these uh, resting heart rate and VO2 max. That might actually help us to uh, pull out those those cardio trainers when we build this model. Um, you know, and and there's a pretty another interesting thing here is notice that uh, you know we did notice that there was a, a linear relationship between active heart rate and resting heart rate. Well, notice there's a similar pattern between the three different uh, weight groups. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, lifestyle groups. Um, you know, they they have a very similar pattern. Uh, same thing with uh, VO2 max, but flipped, right? Which makes sense because of the negative relationship between the the rest and heart rate and and the VO2 max. And then BMI, you know, BMI remains tricky. Uh, you know, it does actually have uh, the same sort of pattern that we've been looking at, but a tighter cluster, uh, or like, I may not use the word cluster, uh, a tighter overlap between the different dis distributions, uh, especially between the weight trainers and the sedentary folks. Uh, and, you know, this, if you think of this makes sense, because uh, weight trainers are actually trying to put on mass frequently. Uh, so, you know, they, they might would have um, you know, higher BMIs closer to those um, who have a more sedentary lifestyle. Uh, okay, so the the last thing that uh, I'm actually I'm I, I'm gathering information from this, right? So I've got this idea that uh, I've 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 got uh, these linear relationships here between the different features. You know, linear between resting and VO two, uh, linear between uh, resting and active, linear between active and VO2. Uh, so I've got this really, uh, these strong linear relationships between the different features, and then they exhibit similar patterns in terms of when I disaggregate the distributions. So one thing I might be interested in there uh, is exploring uh, a correlation plot for those features. How, like, let's, let's not uh, say things like they look the same. Let's actually get some uh, numerical measurements for the um, for the different features and how they correlate. So uh, this is actually, this is a tricky little block of code. Uh, I've had this one for a little while, picked it up, you know, probably read this on Stack Overflow, you know, several years ago and just have dragged it around with me uh, everywhere I go. But it's a nice uh, visualization for, uh, for correlation between the different features. Uh, so I am going to uh, generate a, a heat map, uh, a seaborne heat map uh, using the correlation uh, generated using features.core, but masked uh, with this um, this zeros mask that I'm generating. And and what's that? What that's going to do is actually remove the um, the mirrored nature of the of the correlation heat map. I really am only interested in. Uh, you know, I'm not even interested in the diagonal. Diagonal is going to be a one-to-one. -one, and then above the diagonal would just be a flip of everything below. I really just want to see this. Uh, so uh, indeed, look at this. Very strong, very strong negative uh, correlation between resting heart rate and VO2 max. Also very strong uh, negative correlation between active heart rate and VO2 max. Uh, and then strong positive between active and uh, resting. And you know what this is telling me is that I may not need all of these features in order to do my classification. Uh, one thing that I am going to, in general, want to prioritize, especially thinking about this bias variance trade-off, is I'm going to want to prioritize um, the simplest possible model uh, that that has the best bias, right? That's sort of that this trade-off, right? So a uh, one way of the inter uh, to think about making that simple model is if I can identify these strong correlations, maybe I don't need uh, all of these features to build my model. We'll get to that later. Uh, the last thing I want to do when I'm doing this uh, this EDA is I actually, you know, it's it's hard to uh, to visualize uh, data that's in more than three dimensions. Uh, and in fact, let's even take that a step further. It's hard to visualize data that's in more than two dimensions. Uh, and maybe it's impossible to visualize data that's in more than three. Uh, I, I remember I had a, a physics teacher in school uh, that would he would say, you know, how do you how do you plot something that's in more than three dimensions? 
Well, you plot it in uh, three dimensions and then you write uh, you know, R4 above it. Uh, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do instead is we're going to uh, create a two-dimensional projection of the data that we have using this, um, this tool called, uh, called Teasney. Uh, I am not going into the math uh, behind how Teasney works. If you're interested, there's a link here that you can go uh, read about. Uh, essentially, uh, what we're doing is we're going to use it uh, for dimensionality reduction in order to uh, project our four-dimensional uh, feature space into a two-dimensional space, uh, and then we can uh, we can plot that. So uh, we are going to instantiate uh, the Tsni class from uh, sklearn manifold. Uh, we're we're seeking two components because uh, we want a two-dimensional projection. So uh, we do a fit transform on the features, which get, which gives us features in two dimensions, and we are going to create a pandas data frame from that. Okay, now we are going to uh, plot those features in two dimensions uh, labeled by lifestyle. So I've, I'm creating a, uh, a tuple here of the three colors I'm working with, blue, orange, green, a uh, single map plot lib plot. And then for each color and lifestyle in this uh, zipped list I'm creating, so I'm matching up uh, uh, if, if you're not familiar with, with what this zip does, I will show it to you real fast. It's just going to uh, zip those up. I got to run this first, right? It's going to, uh, here we go, zip those up to associate a color with each of the, uh, the lifestyles. Uh, okay, so I'm going to run that. And then uh, I'm going to filter the data frame, much like I did before, uh, to give me uh, just the the uh, rows for each lifestyle uh, associated with the color. And let's go ahead and plot that. And here we go. Um, so what is this telling me here? Uh, what I'm seeing here is while we do have some bleed between the different groups, it's there's pretty clear separation between the three groups. So what this is telling me is that I am probably going to be able to uh, use a linear model to classify users using this data. Uh, we are going to have clear uh, linear separation boundaries between the data. OK, that is it for this notebook. In this notebook, we will test a simple linear classification model on the aggregate sample. We will also use a helper function to visualize the decision boundary generated by the linear model. All right, let's get into basic classification. And at this point, uh, I have taken the importing of the um, SciPy libraries and actually some other um, some other nice utility functions, and I put it into a, f uh, a file called includes uh, preprocessing. Uh, I'm not going to be showing that in the webinar, but of course, you it's included. Uh, I would encourage you to have a look at it and see see what's going on in there. We are going to make use of this scatter plot with decision boundary function uh, in this notebook. Uh, all right, so let's get into it. So again, just like as we did in the previous, uh, we are going to um, create our features and our target. Actually, the one thing I should point out uh, is that uh, this preprocessing pre step is also going to load the data from that delta table and convert it into a pandas data frame. Uh, so you're not going to have to do that any longer. Uh, it's just being done for you. Uh, so we're going to create the feature and target objects. Uh, one thing we're going to do here is uh, numerically encode the target. So we're going to be working with uh, a library called scikit-learn to do a lot of the, the machine learning uh, work that we're doing here. Uh, actually, all of the machine learning work that we're doing in this particular uh, part of the webinar series. Um, 
Scikit Learn does not like a uh, string encoded uh, target. It's going to need a numerically encoded target. It can still do classification on that, uh, but it's going to need everything passed to it as numbers. So in order to do that, we're actually going to uh, inc label encode the uh, the target vector. You know, as of as of right now, the target uh, looks like this. Uh, it is strings, and we're going to want it to be numbers. So we're going to do that right here with this uh, pre-processing class, the label encoder. So we're going to instantiate a label encoder, and then we're going to use it to fit and transform the target. Uh, so we're going to, oops, we are going to put the uh, target uh, lifestyle in here. And now if I look at the target, you should see that I have uh, both of them, both columns there. I've got uh, each lifestyle and then it's numerical encoding right next to it. Okay, so uh, the first, we, we are gonna fit a um, series of linear models here uh, using uh, logistic regression, uh, which is the linear model that you use for classification. Uh, as I mentioned previously, you know, we looked at this, this TSNI data and we saw that there was a, there was pretty clear, or I should say the TSNI projection of the data and there were clear boundaries between the different classes. So let's go ahead and just pass that to uh, a linear model first, see how well it does. So I'm just running that TSNI operation one more time. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'm going to do is split the, the two-dimensional data, the, 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 the TSNI projection, into training and testing sets. And, and this is just a best practice. I'm, I'm certain that most of you have probably heard of this before. It's a best practice when you're doing machine learning. You should uh, train your model on one set and test it on another. Uh, you're testing the model on data that it has not seen in order to assess uh, the quality of the model uh, when it doesn't see the data. So standard best practice, we're doing it here on the TSNI data. And then we are going to do exactly that. We're going to train uh, the data, we're going to fit it on that this training data, and then score it on this testing data, and let's see how well it does. Uh, I'm passing penalty equals none here to just do a, a straight uh, OLS uh, logistic regression, and you can see it does extremely well, right? It gets a, almost a 96% uh, accuracy uh, predicting the classes using this, this TSNI data. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is, is take the results of this fit. Uh, so we've got this logistic regression model that we fit. Take the two-dimensional features, take the target, and we're going to pass it to this helper function, scatterplot with decision boundary. So uh, just as we did in the previous notebook, where we uh, plotted the, uh, the TSNI data, the two-dimensional data, uh, labeled by... Uh, by lifestyle, we're actually going to do that, but now we're adding an additional uh, an additional wrinkle here, which is we are actually plotting the decision boundaries generated by this uh, logistic regression model. And you can see that uh, as as we uh, suspected, it, there are clear uh, decision boundaries between each of the classes, and this logistic regression does very well uh, classifying uh, on this this TSNI data. Uh, so our work is done. All right, uh, everybody, let's go home. Obviously, I'm kidding. Uh, so the TSNI data uh, works very well on this very small sample of the data. Uh, it is probably going to be, uh, you know, if we wanted to let it run for weeks on end and, and engineer a very like specific approach to, to generating the model, um, we could fit it on all of the data, uh, but that is probably not going to be feasible. Uh, and it's, you know, in general, I think it's a, there, we, with, with a little bit more uh, work here, we can develop a model that is uh, simpler than TSNI that is going to, to work on all of the data. Okay, well, so what we're gonna do next is, let's start with all of the sample data. So uh, what we're going to do is, is we're going to try and fit the same model, uh, see how well it does on uh, all of the, the sample data. So I'm going to do a train test split on this. 
Uh, let me go ahead and just put that in here. Uh, again, using my super fancy multi-cursor techniques. Um, so I might be moving a little bit quicker, uh, but uh, so I'll hang out for just a moment. Uh, so then we're going to uh, fit uh, a logis logistic regression model to the data. And there's a standard pattern that we're going to use uh, when we're doing this. So we're going to fit the model on the training data. We're going to score the model on the testing data. Fit on the training, score on the test. Fit on train, score on test. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to do LR, which is the name we've given our instantiated logistic regression. LR.fit features dot or features uh, train uh, and uh, target train. And then LR.score features test and target test. And there we go. Let's run that. And we have an error. So also our accuracy is, is significantly lower. So what we're seeing here is that uh, we have a convergence warning. Uh, LBFGS is the uh, the internal library that this logistic regression is using to, to do the fit. Um, and it failed to converge, which is why uh, our accuracy uh, is, is much lower when we used all of the data. Uh, so let's let's do this. Let's update the the logistic regression model we're using to increase the number of iterations that it's allowed to do. We're going to increase this to 10,000. Uh, you could also do 1E4 if you wanted to be fancy. Same pattern. Fit on the train, score on the test. And if you want to be lazy, you can just do that. There we go. And we are back to almost a 96% accuracy. Uh, it, but it required more iterations to get there. Uh, so that what this is telling me is that we are going to do well with linear models on this data. But in the, in the subsequent notebooks, we will take a look at that just a little bit. In this notebook, we will discuss the bias variance trade-off, design an experiment to measure bias and variance using the bootstrap, and run it against combinations of features using MLflow. When we talk about the bias variance trade-off, what we're interested in is the uncertainty that's associated with a particular classification model. When measuring this uncertainty, we, we typically think about the bias associated with a model, how, how well it performs the classification, and the variance of that model, how much the model will differ if we use different training data to fit it. We typically think of the trade-off in, in terms of model complexity. So a model that has two features, say BMI and resting heart rate, is likely to perform classification better than one that just uses resting heart rate. But such a model is more complex and likely to have greater variance with different training data. So you can imagine like a simpler model, just one feature, it's gonna have higher bias then a model that has more features is, is going to have lower bias. It's going to be better at capturing the, uh, the underlying phenomena, but will have greater variance with, with new data that's being fed in. An optimal model will simultaneously minimize both. And this is the trick. This is the hard part of the work that we're doing. So in this notebook, we're going to examine many different models for predicting our target. So each of the models that we're going to look at is going to use a different subset of the features. We have four features, mean resting heart rate, mean active heart rate, mean BMI, and mean VO2 max. So we're going to try out uh, models that use one feature, models that use two features, models that use three, and models that use four, and all of the different combinations therein. So it's going to be a total of 15 models. We we'll use the estimated bias and variance of each of these models to assess which model or models are likely to be the optimal model. And we'll also consider the complexity of each model relative to this estimated bias and variance. How are we going to do this? The bootstrap 
is a method for estimating uncertainty. Here, what we want to estimate is bias and variance. So the, the method involves generating a series of subsample sets, sampling with replacement from the original data set. We'll then fit a particular model under examination against each of the bootstrap subsample sets. The accuracy mean across all the models fit to each subsample will be used to estimate the bias, and the accuracy standard deviation will be used to estimate the variance. Okay, let's get into the notebook. Attach to the cluster, run our configuration and pre-processing notebook. Okay, and here's where we're going to generate our bootstrap, bootstrap samples. This is a function that we've written. Uh, it is going to generate samples evenly across each of the three lifestyles. So here is what a sample looks like when generated. We've got uh, five instances from each of the three lifestyles. So here we're going to actually use some Python to, uh, to do this. So we're just using a for loop to generate that set. But you know what, really what we should be doing is a list comprehension in this case. So I'm leaving that for you all as a challenge. I'm just going to grab this function right here. So all we're doing here is just doing it in a list comprehension instead of using a for loop. This is the reads a little bit better. So the preferred, preferred method. Um, okay. Okay, and just to verify that everything is working correctly, let's uh, display the number of samples in each subsample set. So we're going to use the length uh, built-in function uh, on each sample set in our subsample sets. And it looks everything this good. We've got uh, 10 sets of size 15. Uh, let's have a look at the second one. So there we go. Same, they're, they're looking good, looking like we, we've got what we're looking for. Uh, recall as previously, uh, we need to, um, we're going to need to label encode these. So if you notice, uh, they do have the lifestyle encoded as, encoded as a string. We're actually going to need to label encode each of those. Okay, so we're going to fit the label encoder on the original target, uh, the health tracker, uh, the aggregate sample can be lifestyle column. So let's do this. And we are going to encode each subsample data frame uh, one at a time using the for loop. So we'll just do an LE transform on the sample set lifestyle column. And that is done. Okay, so now we're going to design this experiment that we're going to be conducting. So this is going to uh, consist of several steps. Uh, first, we need to build the subsets of features. So uh, we're going to do just one to start with. So we're going to do, uh, the first one we're going to do is a single model uh, a model, a model consisting of a single feature, mean active heart rate. So it's a one feature model. It's just using mean active heart rate. And we're going to build our experimental data subsets by passing in, uh, just that, that list of features to the sample set. So the sample set, the sample sets at this point, uh, in the experimental data subsets are going to be, uh, data frames that have a single column, this mean active heart rate column. And then the targets are going to be just the lifestyle encoded column. So let's go ahead and run that. And if I if I uh, display that, let's have a look at just one of those, just so we can get a sense of what we're working with here. We'll look at the second one again, and you can see it's a, it's a data frame with just a single column. So these are our for the for for one for for one run of the experiment, we have a single column. Okay, and then we are going to uh, instantiate this grid search model. 
So we've we've got this grid search CV. We're we're passing in a decision tree classifier. So I actually mentioned we were going to look at some other families. So here we're actually looking at the decision tree family of models, different from the linear model that we've been looking at. But don't worry, our linear friend will come back. So this grid search model is uh, we're we're actually using it here just for its uh, cross validation uh, purposes. We're we're passing in an empty uh, grid search. Uh, for the for the grid search parameter, so we're only conducting a single single run. And what we're going to be doing here is uh, the cross validation is going to run five times, and so each time it's going to leave out one for each lifestyle, and then use that as the test. So we're we're going to we're sort of doing a uh, not quite a leave one out. We're doing a leave one out uh, validation. Uh, but one for what we were leaving one out for each lifestyle at each run. Uh, so we need to fill this in, right? We need to fit the grid search model. The way we're going to do this is we're going to fit uh, the model on the features and the target. So let's go ahead and run that. And so you can see this is going to go through. This is going to grab each of the experimental data subsets. So there are 10 of them and the associated targets. And it's going to fit each of them using uh, this leave one out decision tree uh, fitting process. And uh, the score is, is already computed as part of this cross validation process. We're going to get a mean test score for each of the 10 runs. And we're appending that to this experimental scores list. Uh, so we're going to wind up with, I mean, here, let's, let's take a look at it before we move on. We're going to wind up with this experimental scores uh, result. And so these are the results of all of, of, of each of those 10 runs, right? So we fit, uh, we fit uh, a decision tree uh, model for each of those 10 experimental data sets using this grid search cross-validation cross -validation process. Uh, here, let's let's go ahead and have a look at. This is going to show us the results from just the last iteration. So you can see, uh, you know, we we have quite a few re uh, results we can look at. So it did uh, it did five splits, and so these are the results on when it, on on each of those uh, those splits, uh, and then we take the mean, and that is the score that we're that we're recording. Uh, let's display the results. So. The feature subset was we used just a single feature this time, and the mean test score across all of our 10 bootstrapped samples was a, a 0 0.69, and the standard deviation was a 0 0.12. So we can take this as a stand-in. Uh, the, the, the mean uh, accuracy uh, can, be, can be used as a stand-in for bias, and the, the standard deviation can be used as a stand-in for variance. Uh, so what we're going to do with this is we're going to throw it into an MLflow uh, experiment runner. So I've def I've defined an experiment runner here, and so each of these steps we've described above, I'm putting into this experiment runner. So we've got a helper function. This is the helper function to run the experiment. So first we're going to uh, build the subsets of features. So that's happening right here. It's going to take in feature subset as an argument and pass that in to generate these sample sets. We're going to fit on each subset using the cross validation. So here's that, that same uh, function we ran. Here we're doing it with uh, logistic regression instead of the decision tree. Uh, and we're going to do, we're do a, going to do a, a fit on the features generated in these experimental uh, data subsets. And then finally, we're going to record the results. We're going to record the feature subset, the, the, the list of features that were passed as the subset, and then the mean score and the standard deviation score. So this is this function that we've written, this experiment runner. And let's go ahead and run that. And it looks like it's done. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but over here, now we have a little green dot next to this, uh, this little beaker bottle right here. This is the result of our MLflow experiment run. So you can see the subset was uh, mean active heart rate. And we wound up with a mean score of 0 0.733 and a standard deviation of 0 0.079. Uh, okay, so we're moving along. Now we want to be able to generate all of the feature subsets. So my feature columns are going to be available at this uh, the original sample aggregate uh, pandas data frame. 
Um, I'm excluding, you know, again, using this exclude object, this is just going to give me the numerical columns. And I'm going to use the uh, iteration tools and the combinations function to uh, generate all of the possible combinations of features. So here you go. These are all of the possible feature subsets. So you can see I've got subsets consisting of a single feature. I've got subsets consisting of two features, subsets consisting of uh, three features, uh, and then uh, a single subset consisting of all, the, all of the features. All right, so we're gonna run these as ML flow experiments using each feature subset. So here we go. Okay, and we are back. That command took almost 30 seconds, which considering we fit 15 models isn't too bad. Let's go ahead and we can refresh this up here to, to see these results. And this is not a terrible way to look at the results, but I actually prefer to use the MLflow API to access the results. So over here, I'm going to use the MLflow.search runs to grab the results. And you'll notice that it gives me the results as a pandas data frame, which is great because we've been using pandas all along. We, we've become hopefully comfortable with, with working with pandas. And what we're going to do is prepare the results data. So the columns that I'm interested in are the metrics mean score, metric standard deviation score, and the params subset. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we may, we may uh, depending on the situation, wind up with an experiment or two with null values. We're going to remove those. And if you've run this more than once, we want to drop the duplicates. So these are the results that we get. And you can see we've got all of our uh, different parameter subsets. So each one of these is a different model. Each one of these corresponds to a different model. And then these are the, uh, the scores associated with those models and uh, the standard deviations associated with those, uh, those models. So the last thing I want to do is I also remember we were interested in the complexity of the model. So in, for, for uh, measuring the complexity of the model, I'm going to use the, uh, this, uh, this column n terms, which is a measure of how many terms uh, were used to build them, how many features were used to build that model. And I'm also going to uh, reduce the or reverse the, the, the mean score. I'm going to change it from uh, an accuracy to an error. So I'm just uh, by I'm just subtracting it from one. And so these are now uh, I have my mean score and my standard deviation. I have my number of terms. And what's great about this now is that both uh, the mean score and the standard deviation score are both in a uh, lower is better situation, whereas previously we wanted a high uh, score, high mean score, and a low standard deviation score. This is we want both low. Lower is better for both of them. So let's go ahead and plot these results. Okay. And you notice the other thing that I've done here is I've also uh, scaled the size of the, of the point in our plot here by the number of terms. So the bigger the point, the more terms went into making this model. So what's interesting to me, I mean, right off the bat, the model with all four terms is not, the, it's not the best model in either sense. You know, if the, the x-axis here uh, is a stand-in for bias, this is the, the mean score. And you can see it's, it is definitely not the, the lowest in, in, the, in, in that regard. It's also, um, you know, actually that's to be expected that, that it has a uh, higher variance because it, it is a, a more complex model. Uh, in fact, like, the, the model that looks the best, this is very interesting, the model that looks the best, both in uh, definitely in terms of bias, but also you know, it's comparable to this one in terms of variance on the y-axis. This single feature model, mean resting heart rate, looks to be uh, a, a very promising model. So imagine that, like we've taken this data set with four numerical features, and when we've designed this experiment to assess which would be the best, what we find is using a single feature may in fact be the best model. Uh, and what's interesting though, is that this model over here, which is also doing very well in terms of variance, is using two completely different features. That's, that's interesting. Uh, this is also a promising model here. Uh, it, has, it doesn't quite uh, achieve the same either in bias or variance, but it is uh, doing very well. 
And it is the same single feature, this mean resting heart rate, but now we're also using the mean BMI. So that's another model that we might want to take a look at. In this notebook, we will run the bias variance experiment against two families of models to assess which family to use. Okay, end of the road here. Let's get into the last notebook, the results analysis. Okay, run our setup notebooks. And now we're going to make use of these functions that we are loading in in the, uh, the pre-processing notebook. Uh, we've been seeing these all along. Now we're going to use them. So uh, we now have a function called generate feature subsets. That's just going to do it for us. Generate bootstrap sample. That's, uh, we're actually, that's actually baked into the, the subsample sets. We're, we're not going to use that one directly. We're going to run generate subsample sets. Uh, and we've got our experiment runner here and a function retrieve results. So here we go. We're going to generate the subsample sets. And that is done. Uh, we are going to now run the experiment using decision tree classification on each feature subset. So uh, feature subsets is already uh, prepared. This is the same thing we ran from before. Uh, we generated those feature subsets right here. Uh, here they are. So we are going to pass each one of those into the experiment runner, and it's going to use a decision tree classification model. And there it goes. Now, as it's running, you'll note that it's actually logging these to MLflow. And we can retrieve the results and display them. Uh, so these are the results of all of our uh, decision tree models being fit. OK, but I think we had a sense that linear models we're going to do we're going to do particularly well here. And I got I actually got that sense from this correlation plot that we looked at very early on. So I just wanted to bring that back here. So if you recall, we had very strong correlation between uh, at least three of the features. So resting heart rate, strongly negatively correlated. But you're thinking about correlation, the negative versus positive correlation. Uh, what you're looking for is uh, features that are strongly correlated regardless of the sign. Uh, so there's very strong correlation between uh, mean resting heart rate, mean VO2 max, uh, mean active heart rate, mean VO2 max, and then the, the heart rates strong correlation there as well. Uh, this is going to tell me that uh, we've, we've got multicollinearity going on for sure. Uh, the fact that we had the, uh, the strong uh, decision boundaries is telling me that linear models are going to do, are going to do well, and um, we probably don't need all the features. So we're going to do the same thing that we just did with the decision tree. We're going to do that down here with the um, logistic regression. And look, I, I made you plug some values in here. This shouldn't be too bad. We're just going to plug in feature subset from the, the for loop right here. And uh, the model we're looking for is logistic regression. Now, if you re recall, we had some issues earlier with the logistic regression uh, not completing its, um, its not converging. So we want to set that max iteration to be uh, t uh, 10,000. And then the other thing I'd like to do here is set the penalty to be uh, none. And there's a little gotcha here. Make sure you use the string none and not the Python keyword none. Uh, that's what the logistic regression model is looking for. So let's go ahead and run that. OK, and we are back. And we can refresh this over here and see that indeed all of these logistic regression models have come in. Uh, we can uh, retrieve the results. We're going to use that retrieve results function, uh, passing in the metrics mean score and standard deviation score and the parameters uh, model and subset. So I've actually got an, an additional parameter here, which is the, the model. Remember, we're using decision tree and logistic regression. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead right now and just create a column called bias, which is going to be one minus that mean score, and a column uh, called variance, which is the square of that standard deviation. I'm going to I'm going to drop the mean score and the standard deviation score, and I'm going to sort the values uh, in the data frame by uh, the bias column, and only display the top ten. And there they are. Uh, you can see that uh, the decision tree uh, appears to be doing very strongly. Uh, logistic regression is not too far behind. In fact, uh, the, this logistic regression has this, the same bias, actually a lower variance than, than this model. Uh, the best model is a decision tree with, um, it looks like two features. Uh, Okay, and we're going to do the same thing we did before where we're going to uh, compute the number of terms. And also this new, this new uh, column here, uh, trade-off, uh, where we're going to compute the square of the bias and add it to the variance. And let's sort by the trade-off. And there actually, it looks like we've had uh, a, a, logis uh, a logistic regression uh, model creep up into uh, into into a, a high a closer closer uh, competition here. Uh, interesting because it was one of the uh, the models with the higher bias, but it had such a low variance that it became competitive. Uh, let's plot those models by trade off and number of terms. So these are the top ten models that we identified uh, and uh, plotted again with the. Uh, circle being the number of terms, and you can see—I mean, this—you can see it right here. The more terms, the higher the variance, um, and therefore the 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 higher the trade-off value. Uh, so uh, that uh, looks like mean resting heart rate is a very strong feature. We we are we. I'm going to guess that when we get to the end of this journey, this is. This is going to be one of our critical features. And I mean, I could even imagine a situation where you build a model with just that feature. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, the folks that are supporting the webinar will be taking your questions and helping you to clarify any uh, misunderstandings or additional questions that you have. When we return for the next webinar in the series, we will be digging in uh, deeper with these linear models, uh, especially uh, models that can be used for future selection, like the lasso model. Um, looking forward to seeing you all then. Thanks for attending.